All right, guys. Um, welcome to um, the, um, this uh, initial quickie on uh, the Spring Framework Roadmap. I actually have a full-length session on moder modern Java component design. Bear with me here. Coming up right afterwards, um, which is going to be a more extensive discussion of the uh, design behind uh, the Spring Framework component model and uh, some of the more recent features that are available in current versions of Spring. So it's a design discussion, a source code-based design discussion. You're highly welcome to, um, to go there. In this short presentation, I'm going to take uh, just a couple of minutes to uh, discuss both what we've done very recently and what we intend to do over the next, um, well, 12 to 18 months, really. So, in all brevity, um, this is some of the, uh, uh, these are some of the focus topics in Spring Framework Photo 2. This is already available, when GA, end of July. We're currently working towards Photo 2 to 3. Plenty of stuff in there. So, uh, uh, in Spring Framework, we tend to have feature releases of a very um, rich kind, right? So a 4.1, a 4.2, a 4.3 release actually brings a lot of features onto the table with um, actually more than you would get out of uh, uh, major releases in, in, in some other projects. It's just the version terminology that we are using. So in uh, 4.2, for example, we have support for default methods across the framework now. We detect annotated Java 8 default methods. We uh, have a a rich event listener model with per uh, method callbacks, so an annotated event method model in uh, for the two now with ordering, with an option to combine it with asynchronous execution, everything um, you would, would expect to be possible in combination with other Spring features. We spent significant effort on a revision of our annotation Elias model, uh, our composable annotation model, where you are able to combine um, out-of-the-box annotations in Spring into custom annotations of your own. Um, and there's a lot of flexibility now in how you can express uh, attribute, attribute references between your annotations and uh, the Spring annotations that you're using. More on that in my modern Java component design uh, session afterwards. The uh, support for JSR 354 is a little bit ahead of its time, but we took the opportunity to support the monetary amount type and the currency unit type in 354 out of the box. So if you're using Spring Data Binding and you happen to be one of the early adopters of JSR 354, uh, anything will work out of the box for you as you expect to. Right? Just use a monetary amount, bind to it, render it out. Uh, we were trying to naturally follow um, the rules there of JSR 354 for the money and currency types, just like you're already used to for Joda time and JDK 8 Java time, the same kind of rules apply. We have significant improvements in the web space, which is the second half here. Right? So uh, the, the support for cross origin requests and in particular the revision of our HTTP cache handling uh, might be strong enough reasons on, on their own to upgrade to Photo 2. We also have a support for, kind of, for streaming responses and server sent events in particular. So SSE support, first class in a Spring MVC handler method endpoint. Uh, previously, you could do this quite easily yourself, but it wasn't very expressive, very first class. Now you're actually able to return an SSE emitter from a Spring MVC handler method. And the framework treats it for you. We have support for JavaScript-based web views, which actually goes along with a revision of the uh, JSR223 support in Core Spring, which is the scripting engine, the scripting abstraction. We um, um, support, in particular, Nashron, the Java 8 JavaScript engine, in particular, but it's, of course, generally usable with any other scripting provider. Right. And uh, the HTML unit integration is a special purpose topic in the web space. Oops. Yeah. Well, it's kind of inverted. Unfortunately, I have the uh, animations mixed up a little here. But it's actually not too bad. We have a Spring Framework for the 3 coming. And I'm already, let me already see at this point, this is the last JDK 6 and 7 compatible release that you can expect to come out of 
uh, Spring Land. Spring Framework 4.3 is the last 4.x feature, uh, feature release. There's not going to be a 4.4. Uh, the next thing we're working towards is Spring Framework 5.0, which is, as we, we, I'm going to mention in a second, is going to be Java 8 based. So Spring Framework 4.3 is a Spring 4 feature release, has the same system requirements, works on 6, 7, 8, and even early snapshots of 9, as 4.2 does right now, and works on server containers back to server 2.5 plus. So you can use it on WebSphere 7 and Tomcat 6 still, even for next year's uh, Spring Framework 4.3. 3 is planned to have an, op an extended open source support life, a little bit like Spring Framework 3.2.x right now. Right? We're already working towards uh, 3.2. 16, um, the, um, the idea is that if you're a JDK 6 or 7 user or are just happy with your existing Spring Framework usage in your target environment, Spring Framework 4.3 is what you're supposed to upgrade to because that's the one with the extended support life. 4.2 will only have regular support until 4.3 is out plus a few months, as we recently have as a policy, but 4.3 is going to be supported until 2019 easily. So what's planned there? Uh, quite a bit of stuff. It's actually a, a lot of uh, uh, ideas combined for smaller refinements in the dependency injection model. There are some, some ideas, some things you cannot do yet. Uh, constructors and configuration classes automatically consider a constructor auto-wide if it's the only one in a demarcated target class. Um, there are a couple of ideas. We're also exploring which kinds of convenience annotations we could be shipping in addition to the ones that we already have. Um, but most of the annotations that we ship right now are basically building blocks. They can be combined, semantically combined, uh, and they could even be combined out of the box. So we are wondering whether we are supposed to ship out of the box coping annotations, pre-built request session scope annotations, instead of leaving it up to you to specify a scope name with that scope. We already have a pre-composed annotation, which is at rest controller, if you ever bumped into that one, which is a combination of a spring at controller, endpoint indicator, endpoint stereotype, and uh, the at response body annotation to uh, consider return strings from handler methods as bodies to be turned into a rest response. This is the kind of way we're going. So imagine just out of the box combinations of certain things you can already express in a natural way with an opportunity to find a good name for it. So custom annotations, composed annotations of this kind, even if we ship them out, in particular, if we ship them out of the box, we have an opportunity to find a good name for it. And I suppose some of those could be very commonly used in practice. And we have a uh, couple of integration upgrades coming, uh, newer versions. Well, actually not newer versions, we're compatible with the latest in Jackson, Jasper, Reports, Hibernate, and so forth already, but more like baseline upgrades. We're going to raise the minimum a little, easing some of our integration, allowing us to avoid the use of deprecated methods. So Spring Framework 4.3 is an important wrap-up release in the 4.x line, uh, but it's actually open for um, community requests, right? If there's anything you would really like to see in Spring Framework 4.x still, by all means, now is the time to raise it. We are in the process of defining, selecting the concrete Spring Framework for the three feature targets and will create the actual for the three branch and start to work towards snapshots there in December. So it's open for feature requests to some degree, right? As much as we can deal with until Q2. So sorry for the uh, mess up, I'll fix it this way. Next up is Spring Framework 5. And uh, Spring Framework 5 aims to be released towards the end of next year, Q4 next year, because it's supposed to follow JDK 9. So a central topic is comprehensive JDK 9 support to the degree that we can, right? We're going to do everything we can to support the module arrangement. Uh, we're going to do everything we can to support the new HTTP client if it actually makes it into JDK 9. Um, we are already testing on the latest JDK 9 snapshots, so there's the actual runtime compatibilities are already there in Spring Framework 4.2, will in particular be there in 4.3. This is about explicit first class support for new JDK 9 features, not just tolerating JDK 9 at runtime, but rather embracing it. At the same time, we're going to raise the baseline to JDK 8 Plus, requiring JDK 8 Plus across the framework, allowing us to use Java 8 source code style all across our own code base. A very important enabler since we can use default 
methods, Java default methods in our own API and SPI interfaces. We can use lambdas internally. It's imp an important step to take to prepare for further innovation to follow and to ease our maintenance uh, in 5.x feature releases. There are a couple of uh, specs that we're tracking, a JSRP30 revision planned, that's the javax.inject Java package. We're tracking servlet 4.0, we are tracking stuff that's happening in the JMS and Jcash space where we already have existing support in Spring, pretty rich support in Spring. We might ship early support for this in 5.0 already. It looks like we are actually going to be ahead of those specs. So um, some of the actual GA support might follow in a 5.1 then, but we are known for doing things as early as technically possible. So we might already do some of this in 5.0. We have a pretty strong HTTP 2 story. I mean, we're already starting this. We are working on some things now already. Um, we can already use Spring Framework Folder 2 with JT number 3 and using HTTP 2 there. So we, we are trying to embrace HTTP 2 enabled web containers, web servers very early. This is going to continue in 5 with the JDK 9 HTTP, cli uh, HTTP client and just a general focus on proper HTTP2 use between clients and servers, everything we can possibly do to make that happen um, will we'll also make it into 5.0 at least, if we can, into 4.3 to some degree. Enabling reactive web architectures is a pretty central topic in its own right. The um, idea is that in Spring 5, we uh, ship a core Spring reactive module with uh, support for reactive streams out of the box. It's a Spring MVC-like endpoint arrangement. So it looks like syntactically very analogous to a Spring MVC endpoint model, but you're actually working on a reactive engine running on Netty uh, currently. There's a prototype already, the uh, uh, Spring reactive project on GitHub, but it's going to be decomposed into a Spring Framework 5 feature theme. Um, where we do allow you to have an HTTP enabled web, uh, um, a reactively enabled web architecture, where in, in, your, in terms of what you're interacting with, you know that you're living in a reactive world. You can return publishers, you, you can do things in a natural reactive style. It is not about trying to adapt Spring MVC as it is onto a reactive engine. It's about taking the Spring MVC syntax and development experience and having a separate but similar endpoint model running on a reactive engine underneath. And there's also going to be some reactive core support all over the framework where abstractions that we have already will be opened up to support uh, back pressure and uh, the end result, ideally, of course, is to allow for completely reactive processing call path from the HTTP endpoint down to the data store and back up. So we're also tracking what's happening with the MongoDB and Postgres drivers. Um, those things make most sense if you can use them, uh, of course, in combination with uh, uh, reactive data store drivers. The idea is that you're not necessarily building a fully reactive application you might have a microservices arrangement where some of the microservices would really benefit from a reactive processing arrangement. Those you will typically then build with the Spring 5 reactive endpoint model. And uh, the rest of the application, many parts of the system, might actually work in a more traditionally oriented processing architecture. That's perfectly OK. The, a microservices arrangement, the microservices movement, allows you to combine basically the best of those worlds uh, for the different purposes that you're building your microservices for. So it's not, an, it's not about all or nothing. It's not an ideological arrangement where you're now supposed to do everything reactively. It's about opting into reactiveness in places where you actually benefit from it with a very familiar, analogous, syntactic endpoint model that feels like a spring component model to you, where you can translate many of your existing uh, of, of your existing understanding of spring component models just right there and to allow you to do things reactively if you need to all right well uh, so much really for the purposes of the quickie talk 30 seconds left um, so next up is 423 uh, we're working on that right now coming next week for the spring framework 4.3 which i've discussed before last 4.x feature release coming 
the target is in May 2016, and Spring Framework 5.0 more loosely planned towards um, the fourth quarter, like end of next year, based on, on the plan that I've outlined. Thanks for your attention. Feel free to join me for my modern Java component design talk in 10 minutes, but in some other room, if I remember correctly. Thanks.